I realized that Britain must be on the verge of a financial collapse. And uh, as I looked into it, you know, all the telltale signs are, are there. And I published an article titled, I think, The Coming Collapse of Britain. And that was on 26th August. And then the very next day on 27th August, Keir Starmer, the prime minister, uh, made a speech in the, in the, in the garden of uh, 10 Downing Street, in which he announced that his government had Alex Crater, how are you? I'm doing very well. Thank you for having me, Andy. Uh, warm greetings from Monaco to your viewers and listeners. Well, warm greetings from Atlanta, Georgia to you and uh, Monaco. <laughs> I think Monaco might be a little warmer. So Tom Lu Luongo um, name dropped you. I was familiar with a lot of your work and a lot of your perspectives, but um, he made an intro to us and I'm very grateful to him for that. And really, let's start with uh, the geopolitics, um, the geopolitical chess chessboard, if you would. Um, just really, where are we at? And specifically, where is Europe at and fitting in on all of this? Um, just want your perspective. Well, in one word, trouble. Europe is in trouble. Uh, I, I think uh, a lot of factors factors came together and I'm suspecting that this could prove to be the worst crisis that, uh, we even know from history books, because I don't know that any previous generation of the ruling establishment has been quite so insane as the current one, you know, um, we had the COVID pandemic which went along with absolutely insane uh, countermeasures, which have carried a massive, massive economic cost. Uh, but even that was preceded by gathering uh, net zero decarbonization measures. Um, then we had, at the very same time, an accelerating ramp up in uh, uncontrolled immigration into Europe, tens of millions of migrants flooded the continent, including the UK, and Ireland and elsewhere. Um, and then we had the, the, you know, the governments, the states developing these, uh, systems of control, uh, like, like track and trace in the, in the, in the UK, uh, you know, preparations that were made for the, for the, for the COVID pass and so forth. Uh, they made the same preparations for the introduction of, uh, CBDCs. Nothing, nothing much has come off it, but you know, this has been tens of billions of dollars that were invested in that. And then, uh, along with all that, uh, they spent hundreds of billions of dollars on project Ukraine. And I think that no government has been more prolific in all this than the, than the British government. And so this has been a massive sequence of malinvestment, uh, uh, absolutely colossal misallocation of resources into things that will result in a, in a whole lot of nothing, but actually, um, social social uprisings across Europe. And now we see that happening in the UK. And I think that this is the reason why uh, last month, Keir Starmer government, uh, they, they barely took power. They, they went with this, uh, very, uh, draconian Nazi like, uh, system of repression, uh, crackdown on free speech and, you know, restrictions on, on people's ability to, to, uh, to gather, to protest, to express themselves freely and so forth, right in the heart of what's supposed to be, uh, one of the world's leading democracies, uh, you know, uh, where you have human rights, 
uh, reigning sacrosanct, uh, rule of law and order and so forth. And so I had to ask myself, why is this? What is going on? And why now? Because all of these pretexts are nothing new, really. This has been going on for many, many, many years. And then, uh, you know, finally, uh, in, in, in like a, a few brainstorming uh, podcasts with Tom, I realized that Britain must be on the verge of a financial collapse. And uh, as I looked into it, you know, all the telltale signs are, are there. And I published an article titled, I think, The Coming Collapse of Britain. And that was on 26th August. And then the very next day on 27th August, Keir Starmer, the prime minister, uh, made a speech in the, in the, in the garden of uh, 10 Downing Street, in which he announced that his government had uncovered a 22 billion pound black hole in uh, British public finances. And okay. Uh, so that's all very bad, except that same Keir Starmer, when he was in opposition on May 1, uh, said in parliament, uh, that the black hole was actually 46 billion pounds. And then he corrected himself and said it was actually 64 billion pounds. And then he corrected himself again and said it was 71 billion pounds. Okay. Now that he's in power, we're back, we're down to 22. I think that the point of all this is that things are really bad, but they are not nearly as bad as what we don't know. Uh, so that was a double negative. I think things are a lot worse than we know. And so, you know, we're coming to that point in history where something bad's about to go down. And I think that it's going to be bad enough that it's worth paying attention to. It's going to be one of those things that'll be in history curricula, like, uh, you know, like the uh, uh, 1929 stock market crash or 1921 Weimar Republic uh, hyperinflation or the collapse of the Soviet Union. I think that bad, which, you know, at the same time is something that's going to affect us all badly because it's not just going to be Britain. It's going to be uh, probably um, Australia and Canada in the same go and Europe. And I think that the same storm is coming from the United States. Only I believe that the United States will be able to weather the crisis a bit better than uh, these old oligarchic colonial powers in, on the old continent. Anyway, so, uh, you know, that's, that I think is, is the one that's worth paying attention to because, you know, as they say, where there's a crisis, there's also a opportunity. Yeah. Um, okay. So I'm taking notes here just to follow up with some questions here. Um, I think it's key that you say you're asking yourself, you and Tom, um, why now and why is this happening? So if we could unpack that a little bit, well, why now? Okay. So, uh, Britain has been one of the world's, no, I, I would say the leading cheerleader for the project Ukraine. In fact, the more you look into Gosh. it, the more you see, the more you see that the British are absolutely in the driver's seat and they are lobbying and uh, coercing everybody to, you know, expand the wars, to escalate tensions, to go all in against Russia and so forth. And they have spent tremendous amounts of money on, on this. Not only in terms of direct investment, you know, well, what are we talking about? About $10 billion worth of military aid and about 5 or $6 billion in financial aid. We're also talking about indirect costs because the, the, the cost of energy has shot tremendously. The cost of sanctions against Russia, we don't really know what they are. I do remember that in June 2023, uh, Europe's High Commissioner for Foreign Affairs, Joseph Borrell, uh, ran his mouth and he said that the cost of sanctions has been 10 times what Europe has provided in terms of military and financial aid to Ukraine. And the number he was talking about was 700 billion euros. 
And so I'm thinking if 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 uh, what if that's consistent with with what the UK has experienced, then maybe we're talking uh, 150 billion pounds in addition to the 15 billion pounds that they spent. And then, you know, what what does this look like? Well, the cost of energy. Um, I've heard farmers complain that the cost of fertilizer has gone from 250 pounds a ton to 1,000 pounds a ton. The cost of heating, the cost of electricity, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of small and medium sized businesses have been absolutely devastated. And this comes on the back of the, all the pandemic countermeasures. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think that whatever black hole is there is probably a lot larger than we know, but we don't know the full extent of it. Uh, we just know that Keir Starmer said it was 22 billion pounds is pro, you know, if you want to be conservative, probably double that. And then he's been repeating this theme of a quote unquote deep rot at the heart of British public finances. And then he has also prepared the nation for uh, the October 30th budget, which, you know, we'll find out when we find out, but he said that it would be extremely painful. And so what does that mean? Austerity. That, that means savage austerity. Yeah. And, uh, at the same time, you know, we have to point out that the, that the Bank of England has started a process of for quantitative easing through a, a repo program. So they announced this repo program in, on 22nd July. Oh, yeah. And then you know, before, just to wrap up with Ukraine, um, Ukraine actually, this wasn't really registered in the mainstream media, but Ukraine actually defaulted because on 31st July, uh, uh, Volodymyr Zelensky uh, announced a freeze on all payments of foreign debts. Uh, so that was supposed to be a temporary measure for two or three months. But I don't see how they're going to be able to, you know, like if they're unable to service foreign debts now, I don't think what changes in two or three months. You know, this is going to be one of those temporary measures like Richard Nixon decoupling of, 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 uh, of dollars convertibility to gold, you know, 50 years later, it, you know, it was never reversed. So I, I don't think this is a temporary thing. So I think that Ukraine's uh, default ha is, has probably pushed Britain over the edge, you know, because all of their investments there are now bad debt. And so, you know, when you have a lot of bad debt in the system, what happens? Well, the central bank has to go to QE. And so this is where the Bank of England's sudden radical new thinking about providing reserves to the system comes into play. And the last news I, I, I read about the, the repo program in, in the UK is that it has ballooned to 40 billion pounds. And this was on September 5th. We are now September 17th. So I think it's probably grown a lot bigger by now. Anyway, you know, so I've been, I've been kind of paying attention to Britain for a few years now. And the first time I, 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 I published anything about it was in October, 2021. So almost three years ago. And so I, I made a prediction. I, I made a, a concrete prediction about this. And I said that the Britain is probably going to make all the, all the mistakes that were made by all the declining powers through history, which means that they will not be able to handle the. Uh, the debt over overhang that they were in, they will implement savage austerity at home, which will suffocate economic growth. And now we know from OECD that Britain is expected to be the worst economic performer among developed nations for this year and for the next one. And that, uh, that the only way to backstop these bad debts and prevent from system from collapsing will be uh, by the central bank going into a QE mode, which came true as well. And then the result of all this is going to be uh, a long, very painful period of stagflation, which might with time morph into hyperinflation. And so, you know, these are, these are the events that, uh, you know, one one needs to pre prepare for, particularly if you have exposure to British um, 
pound or other other British, you know, British debt. My question then would be, um, so this is obviously will spill into the continent of Europe, and it looks like they're already softening up as far as quantitative easing. Correct me if I'm wrong, but spilling over into the uh, the U.S., why has the Fed not been more? And I, I'm not. Sa- I'm saying this as a statement of fact, not a not a judgment. Why hasn't the Fed been more easy with the money, right, as of right now? If that makes I sense. think we're I, I think we're entering into Tom Luongo's domain here, and I'm not sure, you know, because you know the facts you can read from from you know, the Feds and and the government statistics uh, suggest that they should have been a bit more easy with the money. Now. Uh, have they been or have they not been? I don't really know because I think there's a lot of evidence that some of the monetary policy is being conducted in a covert way. Yeah. Say, yeah. you know, the F- the Fed will, you know, like a, like an illusionist, they will be showing you this hand, but the other hand is going to be doing something else. Yeah. And so I think that in, you know, like in concert with uh, the Bank of Japan, with uh, with maybe other central banks around the world, you know, the Belgians, the Luxembourg, whoever, I don't know, they've been maybe providing liquidity to the U.S. system. And we have seen actually that the bank reserves in the U.S. systems in the U.S. system have now been growing again. But, you know, there's still, you know, the narrative is still, well, we might uh, right. loosen up, but we don't know. And maybe sometimes in the future, whereas uh, uh, they're, uh, they're maybe already doing it, you know. And then, you know, there's also these geopolitical considerations where it seems that there's maybe some kind of a civil war going on in the, in the very, within the very banking cartel that's controlling the central banks that the, you know, uh, there's, there's some kind of faction in the U.S. And then there's a faction of these old European banking families and that they, uh, to an extent, at loggerheads and that perhaps the Fed keeping things tight at home is putting these European central banks in, in, in difficulty, which means that it might precipitate a collapse in Europe sooner, providing uh, an opportunity to, for the United States to bail itself out uh, at Europe's ex- ex- expense and then for the, uh, for the American banking establishment to kind of impose itself as, 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 uh, you know, and to subordinate the European bankers to itself. So I, I think these are kind of things where you have to do a lot of imaginative dot connective dot connecting, but some of this is, is almost certainly going on. I just don't know, you know, it's, it's a bit fuzzy to me. And I think that Tom Wongo is, has been great on this and for about two or three years that I've been following his, uh, his analysis has been, has been largely spot on. Yeah, no, he has. Um, but getting back to Ukraine, if you would, it was one, let me just make a statement. It was interesting to me just how peace was, I mean, please correct me if I'm wrong. Peace was on the table, uh, soon after this war started and it was the Brits, which is very interesting. And the Americans, that <laughs> they didn't want peace. They wanted escalation or they wanted it to continue. So it just, yeah, it just, it's interesting the role that Britain played in continuing the war, if you would. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, well, you see, what happened is that when, when the Russians launched their special military operation on, what was it, 20, 22 or 28 February 2022? Yeah. Uh, they started talking to the Ukrainians within four days. Mm -hmm. And so the negotiations between the Russians and the Ukrainians started almost immediately. And by late April uh, 2022, uh, only a few weeks into the special military operation, they already had a very detailed document uh, initialed, ready for signing. The only thing that remained controversial was the status of Ukraine. But they kind of agreed to resolve that issue over the following 10 years, you know, in order to be able to 
uh, sign some kind of a ceasefire and a peace and then deal with the difficult stuff later. And then Boris Johnson parachuted into Kiev unannounced practically and said, no, you're not doing this. Uh, we're going to war. We're going to back you all the way. You know, everybody tends to say that, oh, the Americans sent Boris Johnson to, to Kiev. And I think like, why would the Americans send Boris Johnson? You know, the Americans have a lot of representatives in Kiev already, including the ambassador. Then, you know, Victoria Nuland was still the assistant secretary of state. This was right up her alley. They could have said, sent Victoria Nuland. They could have sent Antony Blinken. Um, why would they say Boris Johnson of all people? And so I don't think it was the Biden administration that sent Boris Johnson. I think it was whoever uh, is, uh, you know, has Boris Johnson on the strings sent Boris Johnson. Again, you know, if you look close into how this whole thing started, uh, you get a very, very strong impression that Britain is leading the game. And it was, in fact, Boris Johnson who kind of pre-announced the war because he gave a speech on the 15th November 2021. Yeah, just a few months before the special military operation began, he gave a, city, a speech in the city of London in which he said that addressing the European leaders, he said, we hope that our friends in Europe will recognize that a choice is shortly coming between mainlining a vast amount of Russian cheap hydrocarbons or standing up for peace and stability in Ukraine. So how he knew that this choice was shortly coming, I don't know. It's a mystery, but he did know it. And, you know, the warning appropriately was issued from the city of London. And I, I do believe that the city of London is still, uh, you know, the ideological and psychological and strategic headquarters of the Western Empire that the, the neocons in the, in the U.S. administration are, you know, their agents in the United States. Uh, but, you know, the United States is being dragged through this um, not, not so much reluctantly because there are a lot of interests in the United States that are keenly interested in the outcome of Ukraine war, you know, namely the banking establishment and the military industrial complex in particular, but this is not an American project. You know, this is, this is only a, a segment of the American political class that's involved in this. And then there's, you know, the, the U S Republic, the ordinary people, the legitimate democratic structures of the United States who are thinking like, why on earth are we even doing this? And then you keep seeing these British, um, how do you call them? Diplomatic representatives, intelligence service representatives, uh, prime ministers, defense ministers, uh, foreign ministers keep jetting around uh, to the United States to try to keep the U.S. on board with the project. But I think that the country that's most on the hook of all is, um, is Great Britain. Got it. So let's, let's play this thesis out then. Um, Great Britain, then according to, according to what you're saying, and I say that with the Dearman, um, they're going to really, it's going to be hitting the fan here in the next six to eight weeks with the new budget. And they're going to be seeing a lot of austerity. They're obviously not going to like that. And business is going to further implode or what businesses left let's make that leap then does that leap over then to the continent of europe and what countries because i'm assuming the biggest trade partners with great britain are not only the u.s but also the continent of europe so who's going to be really affected by that i guess is my question okay so i would you know the the prediction i had made back in 21 is that what we're going to end up getting is 
stagflation with high inflation. So it's going to affect everybody pretty much, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that, you know, if you look at the chart of, uh, so yeah, I predicted uh, high inflation, stagnation for the economy, uh, collapse of the British pound and the collapse of the, of the British guilt. Uh, this has been pretty much going on since 2021. Yeah. But over the last few months, the British pound has actually been gaining strength and the guilds have been gaining strength. So the, the interest rate on those have been going down. Uh, the reason is because, you know, when you announce austerity, the investor class tend to like that. They, it gives them confidence that the, you know, that the government is going to be running a tight ship and conservative uh, policy and so on. So they kind of gain confidence in the currency and on the, in the sovereign debt. And so that's kind of favoring the British public, public finances marginally up until they announce this, this, this budget, which at that point, God knows what's going to happen. But at the same time, you know, this austerity is, is, is what's suffocating economic growth in the, in the UK. Mm -hmm. And so longer term, uh, you know, the government is still not going to be able to fund its budget. Uh, the, the bad debts are still going to be bad. They're not going to magically win in Ukraine and possess themselves of Ukrainian, you know, natural resources for, for new money, good collateral to refloat the financial system again. So it's, it's, it's downhill as far as the eye can see. I don't think that Europe is in, in a significantly better position because the, you know, the Europeans have been following the, the exact same playbook as the UK. So they've been shoveling money into net zero, into, uh, you know, these, uh, these uh, pandemic countermeasures, into the project Ukraine, into immigration. So everything is all the same. It's just that Europe is a bit of a, a bigger economy than the UK. It's not quite so uh, focused on just a, a handful of these things. And so I think that Europe will follow the UK uh, with a bit of a lag. So again, who's in, who's, who's, um, who is going to be? Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, who's going to be impacted the most? Uh, again, everybody, but in what sequence? You know, because if you're if you're in the you know, like if you're if you're British defense establishment, mm -hmm. the good times are starting because you know as at the same time as Keir Starmer is announcing the how do you call it austerity, mm -hmm. and he's cutting the the old people's uh, heating allowances, the heating subsidies, which they know that about 4,000 pensioners will die of hypothermia. They know this. So they're, they're going ahead with this anyway. At the same time, they're promising continued support to Ukraine and even increasing it. And at the same time, they're adding about 3 billion pounds to the de defense budget, which is about 4.5%. So if you're in the defense establishment, you're doing well. If you're in the financial industry, you're doing well because Bank of England is splurging all the quantitative easing that you're going to ever need. They're going, they, they said they would accept any kind, well, they haven't used those words, but the, the, in the implication is exactly that, that they will be accepting any kind of toxic pledge as money, good collateral, and, and they're going, they're going to be giving you pound for pound uh, for the value of it, probably including the Ukraine bonds. And so I think that you're in trouble if you're a, an independent business, if you're a small or medium sized company, if you don't have government contracts and if you depend on fixed income. So that means pretty much ordinary people and ordinary entrepreneurs. Yeah. The middle class, really. The middle class. Yes. Yeah. So. Where does like natural resource come into all of this? And you made a comment at the beginning of this conversation about similar to the fall of uh, the Soviet Union. And I 
I'm assuming we're about the same age. I'm I'm 50 years old and I lived through that, but I lived through it differently than you. You were across the across the pond, if you would. But I just remember all of these oligarchs, if you would, or they weren't oligarchs, they were just they were former former members of the government. <laughs> they yes, went and bought up all the assets very, very <laughs> cheap, the natural yeah. resources, and yeah. they became oligarchs. Is that you see what's going to happen because there's so many assets that are cheap. I mean, I'm just looking at crude oil, or I should say West Texas uh, oil in the U.S. here, and it's so cheap relative to inventory levels. So, yeah, I guess that is my question. What, where do you see natural resources play in all of this? And do you see this as, as a grab bag, somebody coming in and swooping them up cheap? Well, uh, I am generally a strong believer in the, uh, you know, the commodity super cycle hypothesis. Uh, I think we're going into a commodity super cycle, which is, you know, something that might span anything between 10 years and 25 years, historically. 25 years. Wow. I'm not laughing at you. I'm just like, that's just that's crazy. That's awesome. I well, mean, that's you know, the that's, the opener, the owners. Yeah, yeah, that's, you know, that's been the historical, how do you call it? Based on, based on based historical on. precedents, you know, it, was it, th there are these massive cycles. And uh, I, I, I think, you know, we recently hit a 50 year low in the ratio between uh, the valuation of equities versus commodities. So commodities super cheap, uh, equities super in, in the bubble territory. And so what, what, what happens over the next 10 years or 25 years or, or anything in between there is that either we're going to see the equities uh, come down considerably or we're going to see uh, commodities go up considerably or, you know, both possibly. Right. And... You know, I also have to say that the, 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 the precedents we have for these com commodity super cycle uh, uh, sequences are all based on the last 150 years. And the last 150 years is more or less all within the same system of governments that, is, that has been defined by the British, um, by the British Empire to this day, you know. And uh, what that has entailed is that you always suppressed commodity prices uh, so that you can obtain them from your colonies at, the, at, at rock bottom prices, right? Yep. And so we've, we've consistently seen that commodities exporting nations have always been mired in poverty for some reason. You know, it's not, it's not a coincidence. It's, it's a deliberate policy. Today, we have the rise of China which has a very, very different strategy. Uh, the Chinese want to raise the whole global South out of poverty because China has positioned itself as the global manufacturing hub of, in, of the world. And they want to have a couple of billion people in the world who are affluent enough to buy their stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, instead of, um, instead of the, you know, global ruling establishment systematically um, suppressing economic growth and development in commodity exporting nations, you're going to have the opposite where the Chinese deliberately want those economies to develop and to, to become more, more prosperous and to absorb a lot of that commodity uh, production locally. And so I think that that, you know, the end, the end of the British system and the beginning of the of the new system, which is, you know, whatever, call it Chinese if you like, is going to put an additional upward pressure on commodities. So the next the next bull cycle in commodities could be bigger than what we've seen in the last 150 years. Wow. And so I think that um, you know, adding exposure to commodity markets to your investment portfolio is is something that people should look into generally in the future. I'm not just talking about buying the stocks of oil producer and gold miners and so forth, but to actually gain 
exposure to the prices themselves through, you know, through future contracts, through mini futures, whatever you can trade. See, you know, I, I don't think CFDs are legal in the United States. Uh, these are um, contracts for differences, which are syn synthetic trading instruments, but you can gain exposure to things like oil and gold and coffee and cocoa and, and so forth in relatively small denominations. So if you, if you want to buy a, a contract of uh, oil futures, you have to buy a thousand barrels, which means that what you have to cash out 70, $75,000 today. Whereas uh, with CFDs, you can buy 10 barrels, you know, if I, I, I don't know, it depends on the broker, but usually uh, it, it's a very, very small denomination. So it's not very difficult to, um, uh, to gain exposure to those. Now, you know, these things are kind of like, uh, like you could gain access to, uh, to a motorcycle. Uh, it's, it's great. It gets you from point A to point B It's it's doing what it's meant to do. But if you press on the accelerator too hard, you're going to get into trouble. You're going to get hurt. There's a lot of risk. Very careful. And I think that in the United States, maybe the easiest way to gain exposure to commodity prices are ETFs. So you can find, if you can find good ETFs with, uh, you know, exposure to energy, uh, commodities, to agricultural commodities, to, um, to metals, industrial and precious, I think that, that there's a good case to make an allocation to those funds. Is there a specific commodity group, if you would, whether that's metals, energy, agriculture, um, industrial metals, whatever that you prefer over the others right now? Um, not necessarily, you know, gold has done really, really well just now. Recently it hit all time highs a day before yesterday, I think on Friday, perhaps 13th September. Yeah. Uh, and I think maybe it rose even a little bit higher yesterday, but, um, it's hard to say because you know, at the same time, silver, ha you, you know what, it doesn't matter what happened up until this day, because it's too late. You can't make those decisions fast. What matters is what's going to happen over the next 12 months or, you know, 10 years. And so in that sense, uh, you know, I think the best way to go is to be as diversified as possible because you cannot predict which commodity is going to be doing the best. And even, you know, with respect to gold, we've seen over the last two, three years that Whereas gold has formed this beautiful uptrend, silver has barely moved. It's, it's still, it's still not reached 2022 highs. It, it's kind of stuck. It's, it's moved a bit higher, but it's stuck. So maybe silver will do better than gold over the next few years. Palladium and platinum have done absolutely nothing. They look like they're dead, but, you know, they're. They're trading very near to their historic lows. Um, so I think it's, it's impossible to predict which commodity will do best. So the best way to go about it is to be diversified, you know, have some, you know, have an allocation to agricultural commodities, have some, some assets in, have some money in, uh, in, uh, in metals and have some money in, in energy, definitely. I think maybe, you know, with a strategic view, maybe, maybe energy is, is really, really important. I don't know if it's going to underperform or outperform, whatever, but it is going to be extraordinarily important. Got it. Let's talk here about your work here. I know you've written several books. Um, how can people find those? Um, and if people want to know more about you and potentially do business with you or reach out to you, how do they do that? Uh, I'm easy to, I'm easy to find on Twitter on X. So my handle is at naked hedgy. I actually just got locked out of my account today. And the reason why I got locked out, you know, yesterday, uh, Thierry Breton, I, I have to share this story. Thierry Breton, who is European unions, um, you could call him a um, how do you call it? Uh, censorship czar. Yeah. I was going to say censorship. Yeah. Censorship czar. He, he handed in his resignation, I think just yesterday. He did. Yep. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I tweeted his announcement. I retweeted his announcement 
and saying like, oh, that's a shame. I would have loved the opportunity to tar and feather you and run you out of town on a rail. But I guess, you know, just you spending more time with your family is, is a win, is a big win for all the rest of us. And for that, I got locked out of my account. And they're like, uh, we might unlock you in a week, but it could t- take longer. I'm like, what did I say? <laughs> um, and so I guess, yeah, I'm there, but for the moment, I, I can use Twitter as read only for the next week or so. I also publish a Substack. My Substack is Alex Craner's Trend Compass. And I, I've kind of really liked the uh, Substack. I've, I've published there for the last two years. And, and now I'm really thinking about using Substack for my business newsletters because w- what I do is I publish a daily um, trend following newsletter called uh, Trend Com- iSystem Trend Compass. And it's a bit of a costly service, but I think that if I, if I put it on Substack, I'll be able to reduce the price very considerably. And so I'm thinking about going with with a U.S. portfolio, which will cover, you know, the main United States indices like uh, NASDAQ, S&P 500, Russell, and the 10-year note, the 30-year treasury bond, uh, U.S. dollar yen, U.S. dollar euro, gold and silver. And then I'm also thinking about making a major markets portfolio, which will also include the U.K. Because, you know, if any, because here's the, here's the problem. You know, we can predict certain things kind of in the distant future, in the sense that we can see that there's this crisis of stagflation and inflation and commodity super cycle coming in the, in the, in the, in the following years. But you can't say when the trend might emerge, how long it might go for, how fast it's going to grow uh, or, or collapse. And so I, I've learned to believe in systematic trend following where an algorithm tells me, now buy, now sell. And I've been doing this for uh, more than 20 years. And I, I believe in that because uh, it, it kind of helps you not have to predict things and be right. And it also enables you to follow a large number of markets that you couldn't otherwise focus on, you know, because you know, like maybe people know U.S. stocks or they know the European stocks. But, you know, how do you trade copper? How do you trade oil? How do you trade gold and silver? How do you trade uh, U.S. treasuries or British guilds and so forth? So, you know, if you have an algorithm that's, that's looking at all these things and that's not diluted in terms of focus and, and, and attention, uh, then that's a better way and it's, it's more consistent. And then, you know, then you have to manage your risk because like with the, with the vehicles, you know, don't want to press the accelerator too aggressively. Uh, yeah, so basically, you know, you can find me on Twitter. My handle is at Naked Hedgy. A Substack, it's uh, Alex Craner's Trend Compass. And then my, you know, for investors and traders, my, my website is iSystem Trend Following. And there, you know, it, that people can find about the newsletter, about term key portfolio solutions, and about uh, commodity and FX price hedging services. Excellent. And I'll put all of these links in the show notes uh, below this talk. Real quick, uh, you've written a couple of books. Should people buy those on Amazon? (laughs) Uh, No, Amazon canceled me completely. I heard. And so they they deleted all my work. They deleted all all the reviews. And then they continued selling one of my books for something like $900 a copy. But, you know, I didn't see any of that money. And so I decided at that point to put my, both my uh, trading books online for free so people can download them as, uh, as free downloads. And they're not free because they're crap. One of my, my first book called Mastering Uncertainty in Commodities Trading actually got a, 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 an award as the best book for commodities trading for investors and traders in 2021 and 2022. And, uh, but the newer title, which is called Alex Craner's Trend Following Bible to my, you know, is, is didn't get any uh, awards, but I think is a better text. So people can find those books as free downloads on my website, iSystem Trend Following. 
you go to the about tab and then if you scroll down you find the the download buttons for for both books and i again the the trend following bible i think is a is the better of the two if you'll choose one okay excellent again i'll put all of this link to all of this in the show notes uh both on youtube as well as the uh, podcast Alex, I think we'll uh, wrap it up there. I just want to thank you so much for your time. You had great insights and you've uh, been incredibly gracious with me uh, trying to get you on. So I just, I just want to thank you for that. Andy, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. And again, a warm greetings to your viewers and listeners. Thank you, Alex. Take care.